It's a great pleasure to see so many people here uh, to honor our dear friend and colleague, Stuart Friedman. Um, his loss last year was a tremendous blow to all of us in the physics department, uh, both personally and professionally. Um, we miss Stuart for his excellent scientific research and leadership, but we also miss Stuart for his sense of humor and his ability to, frankly, tell it like it is. Those who know Stuart know <laughs> what I mean by that. Um, I think it'd be great. I think we all agree that the world would be a better place if we had more people like Stuart in this world. Um, so we've come together to celebrate his life and what would have been his 70th um, birthday. So I'm delighted that uh, Stuart's friend and contemporary, Steve Chu, is giving the opening lecture tonight. Steve's talk is titled Remembering Stewart and the Friedman Exclusion Principle. Uh, Professor Gene Cummins was advisor to both Stewart and to Steve, and I'm gonna hand the floor over to Gene, who will introduce Steve. Thank you. I was my privilege when I was an active professor to have many excellent research students, and among them, Stuart was one, and Steve was another. And uh, I, I can't think of a more appropriate way of celebrating Stuart's memory than this symposium. <clears throat> now, Steve was an undergraduate at the University of Rochester and came to Berkeley in 1970. I met him in 1970. He was a brilliant student here at Berkeley, received his PhD in 1976, and then was a postdoc for a couple of years here. Subsequently, he went to AT&T Bell Laboratories in New Jersey, where he worked for about a decade, and then he became a professor of physics at Stanford University. It was at AT&T Bell Labs in the 1980s and at Stanford in the 1990s where he did brilliant work on trapping and cooling of atoms. And that led to his Nobel Prize in 1997, which he shared with William Phillips at the National Institute of Standards and Technology and Claude Cointenugy of the Collège de France in Paris. Now, in addition to the Nobel Prize, Steve has a very long list of awards and honors which he has earned. But if I were to list them, there'd be no time for his <laughs> talk. In 2004, Steve became the director of Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and served in that capacity until 2009. Uh, during this period, he became very concerned with energy conservation with the problems and opportunities of alternative sources of energy and with the ever-growing menace of climate change and global warming. And he act, worked very, very actively and very successfully at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory to enhance the research capabilities of that laboratory in those areas. It was a, very, very impressive job that he did. And that led to his appointment as Secretary of Energy in the Obama administration, where he served from 2009 until 2013. And he served with distinction there also. Now Steve is a professor of physics again at Stanford and also a professor of molecular and cell physiology so you see that he has done many, many things with great distinction. I'm very pleased to introduce most distinguished Professor Steve Chu. Thank, thank you, Jean. Um, it is truly a pleasure to be here, uh, to be part of this um, uh, symposium honoring Stuart Friedman, uh, it, and it is in part, sadly, a memorial service, and I'm always reminded of what Yogi Berra said about attending your friend's memorial services. 
If you don't go to theirs, they won't go to yours. <laughs> um, anyway, I hoped that this lecture captures a little bit of Stuart's um, humor. Uh, I didn't, so it's, it's going to be a kind of a fake Stuart imitation uh, as best I can. So, um, so let me proceed. So you might ask, why have I been asked to do this? Um, and um, it, it tracks in here. This is, could we turn the front lights off a little bit? I know, or the, I know you guys are filming, but, uh, but it would be better to see the slides, if you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, time versus a person's uh, scientific standing. And the first thing when you're a graduate student or a postdoc and you get your first contributed paper, uh, this is the first real milestone you're, uh, thank you, um, going up in the world. This is your first contributed paper. And then, of course, it uh, may often be filed by the first invited talk. This is really great. And then if your career is really taking off, you get your first plenary talk. But plenary talks, there's a great inflation regarding the names of talks, invited talks, plenary talks. Of course, there's keynotes. <clears throat> now, you know, it's, uh, it's peaking because once you start giving keynotes, this is uh, 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 getting to a high point in one's career, and then it starts to lag. <laughs> uh, the first after-dinner talk, followed by you begin to talk about other people's work in after-dinner talks. <laughs> followed by you begin to mess up people <laughs> talking about other people's work. And now, uh, uh, followed by you become a bureaucrat <laughs> speaking at ceremonial functions. Now, on the scientific standing, I didn't show what the uh, y-axis is. It's zero here, <laughs> and it can go negative. <laughs> and you begin to reminisce about the good old days, but you butcher the history. So, um, so this is what I plan to do. <laughs> Now, Stuart also reached many of these high points, uh, even becoming uh, sort of a bureaucrat, even though he loathed bureaucracy. And um, so I want to just show you, uh, here he is in a cer ceremony, the 100th uh, anniversary of Louis Alvarez's birthday, and he's talking about this. I just well, want to play. Of all the uh, speakers here, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that probably I knew uh, uh, Professor Alvarez, the least. In fact, it's uh, uncomfortable for me to call him Louie, but I'll do my best. Uh, I came to Berkeley 20 years ago, and most of what I know about Alvarez, I learned from Rich Muller. He's rich in the uh, On the other hand, uh, I was at Berkeley as a student, and I met him then, and I'll tell you about that. And the other thing I find ironic is that uh, as Rich is constantly pointing out, a lot of the problems I've taken on in physics have his fingers uh, in it somewhere. And that's been constantly pointed out to me, mostly by Rich. Uh, <laughs> after 20 years, <laughs> uh, I have to say that some of the stories he's told me, he's told me more than once. But as we grow older together, I tend to forget them. So. <laughs> So anyway, that's Stuart. Um, another uh, big deal talk uh, is, is he's giving a summary talk, and he's uh, perhaps poking fun of himself, shooting himself, or his shadow. Um, and uh, Stuart, as was pointed out, did not suffer fools gladly. Um, and, so, and he was, could be pretty honest, even with colleagues and friends. And so during this uh, workshop on ultra-cold neutrons, the lead-off talk was given by a very distinguished uh, theoretical physicist, William Marciano, who, who actually uh, shared the Sakurai Prize in 2002 for his rate of corrections. And uh, in Marciano's talk, he said, the status of neutron decays. This is in one of Stewart's talks. And so I just went to the original source, and, and is, there's this formula. V sub UD equals blah, 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 the color of the master formula. And underneath, Marshall says, or the three laws of neutron decay. And if you notice formulas one, two, and three, they just move the symbols around. Say V, U, D, you know, just some algebraic divisions. <laughs> <laughs> so in Stewart's summary talk, he took umbrance at this. <laughs> so he pointed out. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I haven't given this before, so I can't give it straight face. State owns law and write three forms of own law. <laughs> Use the equations. <laughs> <laughs> Computer searches, it's a, you know, it's a law, they're law firms, or maybe they're state law firms. But, <laughs> but anyway, so the winner of the thing was E equals IR, I equals E over R, R equals E over I. <laughs> so Stuart actually points out that, golly, it sounds exactly like this <laughs> to the poor theorist, Marciano, the Sakurai Prize winner. <laughs> So, uh, you know, poor, you know, is, he's telling it like it is, and he just delivers his summary talk and just points out how ridiculous that slide was. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, so this name of the symposium is Measuring Nothing and Getting It Right. Now, if you look at the titles, you can't read the fine print, so I'll help you. Uh, you know, he starts out with his PhD thesis, and he couldn't find a discrepancy with quantum mechanics, so it didn't work. He couldn't find free quarks looking in cosmic gray showers. He couldn't find tachyons, particles that move faster than the speed of light. He couldn't find free quarks in E plus E minor annihilations. He looked for Higgs boson in nuclear decay. Couldn't find that. Couldn't find some sharp E plus E minus resonances that other people found. Uh, he couldn't find uh, a low energy neutrino oscillation in mu to E in certain geometries. There was a report of a 17 keV neutrino. He couldn't find that. And finally, when he tried to de detect reactor neutrinos, he didn't even get the right number. <laughs> now, so this uh, has been pointed out in celebration of Stewart's 60th birthday by Bob Kahn. And he says, and I'll just read it, and now it was time for Stewart to display his real virtuosity, having failed to find hidden variables, fractional charges, tachyons, quantum, et cetera, et cetera. He wasn't about to accept blame for another failure. He decided it wasn't his fault, but the fault of the neutrinos. What chutzpah. <laughs> this is a man to celebrate. So we will spend a little time doing this. Going back to this picture, you might have, you know, he's holding this book. He, he was very proud of this book. Um, it's the neutrino matrix. He was, in fact, so proud of this book, he made sure when I came back to Berkeley that I, he presented me as soon as he saw me with a copy of this report. Uh, why? Well, because he was the co-chair of this report. And um, it, in, it's, a, it's a brilliant report telling about all the great discoveries in the Juchino sector over the last half century. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about just one thing and this is a crazy thing about quantum mechanics, where you have neutrinos, and the way neutrinos propagate in space may be different with the way they interact in matter. And in that, uh, so these are, uh, let's see if I can, is this, yes. These are the neutrinos propagating in space. These are the neutrinos that you might want to detect with a detector, and they're all mixed up. And so again, uh, Stuart, gave a, uh, a big cheese talk. This is now in 2001, uh, celebrating Enrico Fermi. Now, I should also say that Stuart is a bit of a science historian. He loved to go into the history of what he was doing. And in this talk that he gave, he also went into this. And he looked at uh, a, a letter that Fred Reines and Clyde Cowan wrote to Enrico Fermi in 1955. And I'm just going to read it to you. We thought you might be interested. Dear Enrico, you that we thought you might be interested in the latest version of our experiment to detect the free neutrino. As you recall, we planned to use a nuclear explosion for the source. You could do that in the 50s. <laughs> 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 Only last week it occurred to us that background problems could be <clears throat> reduced to the point where the Hanford pile, which, by the way, was a reactor that, Verica's original reactor was underneath Chicago Squash Stadium, it was something that was actually built, for those of you who don't know, in less than one year from an empty room to the first sustained nuclear reaction. You couldn't even get a permit to, <laughs> to clear out the space in one year today. But so those days, you could really move fast. And boy, did Fermi move fast. Anyway, 
So only list, So then Hanford was the second, one of the early second reactors to build something that would actually make uh, plutonium. So this was in uh, Washington. He said, our detectors at 10 cubic foot floor, floor filled with cylindrical with 90 photomultiplier tubes. They're all very excited about it. And, and they say, we, we, we're really making rapid progress. In the next few months, we shall be at Hanford searching for the slippy particle. We'd, of course, appreciate any comments you might make. Enrico writes back. This is October 4. October 8, he writes back. Dear Fred, thank you for your letter. I was very much interested in your new plan for detection of the neutrino. Certainly, your new method should be much simpler to carry out and have great advantage that the measurement can be repeated many number, any number of times. <laughs> so and so, so and so. And he says, I shall be very interested in seeing your 10 cubic foot simulation counter is going to work. I don't know of any reason why it should not. Now, fast forward from 1952. Uh, when you want to look for neutrinos, now from a reactor and possible neutrino oscillations, as you all know, um, uh, Rhinus also found that he built a, a detector to detect neutrinos coming from the sun, and he kept on getting the wrong answer. It looked like it was maybe only one third of the neutrinos were, were hitting the sun. Lots of calculations by John Bacall and others, recalibrations, just couldn't figure it out. And uh, so there was something missing in this. And so um, in any case, uh, uh, Suzuki uh, started this experiment, then joined later by uh, Giorgio Grada and Stuart Friedman. And Stuart Friedman here at Berkeley and Giorgio Grada at Stanford were the US spokespeople for this experiment. And uh, Atsu Suzuki was the uh, Japanese spokesperson, it was a scaled up version of the Rhinus Callan experiment. It was a big scintillator. It used the same anti-coincidence. You get to look at direct deposit of energy and delayed response of a neutron. And that enabled you to go way down in the, um, in, uh, the thresholds and you have very, very sensitive detection. And very, very shortly after that, they began to see amazing things. So this is just a big version of this. Uh, this is the outside of this liquid scintillation counter. They filled the inside with some uh, liquid scintillator surrounded by mineral oil. And, uh, and Stuart was giving this talk in 2001. Camelot had not turned on. And so in his sense of wry humor, he said, he <laughs> requoted from, I shall be very interested in seeing how your 40,000 cubic foot scintillation counter is going to work, but I don't know of any reason why it should not. <laughs> Uh, typical steward, uh, and uh, they turned on and very shortly after saw very compelling evidence of neutrino oscillations from, you know, this, this reactor in Japan was in the middle of the mountains, and in Japan, which had at that time about a third of its energy, electrical energy generated by nuclear reactors, there are mountains and there's ocean. So the, you had to put your reactors next to the ocean. So in the middle of Japan mountains, in the edges around a circle, beautiful reactors, all roughly the same distance. So it was almost, it was even better than perfect because sometimes they had to close down for maintenance and then you could actually monitor this. So it was a great experiment. Um, in a subsequent experiment, they, the mixing angle uh, is also a function of the energy of the neutrinos. They could, if the detector worked so well, they could make energy cuts in the neutrinos, and they could actually see the oscillation of the oscillation, so the os actual oscillatory behavior of these neutrinos. It's a fantastic experiment. Um, now, I'm not gonna go through all his experiments, all his inability to see things. Um, and in fact, tomorrow and the next day, are gonna be covering that. So I'm going to only talk about just one other thing. And so since most of the time when I look in this audience, I see mostly high energy types, nuclear types, right? Uh, and uh, occasionally I see out there in the distance uh, Gene Cummins students like Phil, who are some of them begin to be atomic physics types. Gene was everything, so that, anyway. So uh, I'm gonna concentrate on something that you know less about, so maybe I won't butcher it as much, or at least you wouldn't know. 
<laughs> and this has to do with Stewart's PhD thesis experiment, his inability to find hidden variables. So let me start from the very fundamentals of quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics is pretty mysterious. Um, I think when you're a professional physicist, you sometimes forget this, but for those of us who teach quantum mechanics, uh, and I've taught quantum mechanics maybe f half a dozen times uh, at Stanford, uh, the last four or five uh, graduate quantum mechanics, and, and when I taught quantum mechanics, I really began to love it in a perverse way. And it's because quantum mechanics, as Niels Bohr said very early on, if it hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Feynman said something very similar. He said in uh, a lecture, QED, The Strange Theory of Light and Matter, if you're not gonna be able to understand quantum mechanics, why? Then are you gonna sit here this time when you won't be understanding what I'm gonna say? It's my task to convince you not to turn away because you don't understand it. You see, my physics students don't understand it. That's because I don't understand it. Nobody does. <laughs> All right. So quantum mechanics has been wildly successful. Using quantum mechanics, people were able to invent the transistor. It would have been very difficult to, to build a transistor without quantum mechanical knowledge of how electrons move in solids. Uh, they were enabled to invent the laser. They were able to uh, invent magnetic resonance, uh, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and magnetic resonance imaging. And here's a, a live, uh, MRI scan of a beating heart in real time. It's a marathon runner, so it's going pretty slowly. So the quantum mechanics is pretty amazing. Um, but the root of the problem and, and the conundrum that Stuart was ultimately gonna face actually goes back to the very beginning that particles can act as waves and interfere with themselves. And so here's a little excerpt two to remind you get, about this. Like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. Right, it doesn't make sense, but it gets worse. A single electron leaves as a particle, this is the interpretation becomes a wave of, of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. In fact, but quantum physicists were completely says baffled by it this. It goes through every so path possible. I decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble it produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. All right, so what is the problem? This, this is the fundamental problem, and so quantum mechanics was developed and invented and was a self-consistent theory that said, okay, we can predict these things, we understand them, uh, but one of the foundations of quantum mechanics is that what you're measuring is actually intimately dependent on the instrument you're using to measure the system. And uh, Bohr and Heisenberg believed that that was, the f quantum mechanics was the full theory. They're uh, the essential, the, the par probabilistic predictions of where each electron with his strings is as good as it gets. There's nothing better than that. And Einstein took umbrage to that. So he began to debate with Bohr what's going on. Um, and uh, there are a series of debates between Bohr and Einstein that uh, happened in the, uh, starting in the mid-1920s that went into the 1930s. And out of this, um, 
Einstein was known to saying that God doesn't play dice, of which Bohr said, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. <laughs> so um, so uh, it heats up. He, Einstein is giving paradox after paradox. It usually takes Bohr just that night, based on application of the uncertainty principle, say, no, 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 it's OK. It's all self-consistent. Don't worry about it. And then Einstein comes up with another paradox, and he shoot, and then Bohr shoots it down. So you know, Einstein really doesn't. He's tears his hair out, and he says he writes to Schrodinger, who also doesn't like quantum mechanics, and he says the soothing philosophy or religion of Bohr and Heisenberg is so cleverly concocted that for the present it offers believers a soft pillow from which they are not easily chased away. This religion does damn little for me. So then something happens. He, with Rosen and Podolsky, invent this EPR paradox. I'll explain it in a minute, but let me just tell you how Bohr reacted to this. So this is Leon Rosenfeld, who was working with Bohr at the time. And he reports this EPR paper to Bohr. And said this, Rosenfeld says, this onslaught came down first as a bolt from the blue. As soon as Bohr heard my report of Einstein's argument, everything else was abandoned. We had to clear up the misunderstanding at once. So great excitement, Bohr immediately starts dictating me the outline of such a reply. Very soon, however, he becomes hesitant. No, this won't do. We must try it all over again. We must just make it quite clear. So it goes on for a while, with growing wonder at the unexpected subtlety of the argument. They return to me. What can they mean? Do you understand it? And there would be followed by some inconclusive exegesis. Uh, I think it's a swear word. OK, let me, let me tell you what it is. <laughs> In, in one of six languages. Uh, so this is um, the basic idea of the einstein rudolph paradox. Suppose you have a quantum system, and just pretend the angular momentum is 0, the initial state and the final state, but it spits out two particles, two electrons, two photons, two of something. And so there are two detectors <clears throat> um, and two observers, Alice and Bob. and um, because the angular momentum is 0, one can show that if one detector sees uh, plus angular momentum, the other detector better see minus angular momentum, because the angular momentum is 0. So you might say, well, what's the big deal? This is like you've got a black marble and a white marble, and you shoot a black marble and a white marble out, and this guy sees black, this one's got to see white. No big deal. But quantum mechanics says something different. It says you can make the detectors be different, and they don't have to measure black and white. They can measure red and green. And if you measure red over here, then it demands this to be green. And if you measure green over here, it demands it to be red. In fact, you can switch between detectors, black and white, red and green. And the apparatus, the measurement, then determines if you make a measurement over here, then it's going to dictate what happens over here. But before you make the measurement, it's in both states. That's what was really driving Bohr crazy. OK, it's not just an interference, because these detectors could be light years apart. All right, so this is what I just said. You can rotate the detectors. You can measure plus and minus. You can measure vertical polarization, horizontal polarization. You can do any of these things. So um, let me just cut to the. Let me first just tell you what quantum mechanics says. Quantum mechanics says you're in a combination state where one possible wave function is plus Bob and minus, plus and minus for Bob and Alice, plus angular momentum, minus angular momentum. But you're also in a minus plus state over here. Bob would have the minus, and Alice would have the plus. But before you make the measurement, you've got to be in both. And when you make the measurement, you project either to this one or that one. So that's the canonical quantum mechanics. It's all very self-consistent. And um, so Einstein says, look, I believe in deterministic physics. The system must have been in one of these two states. We just happen not to know about it. So it appears probabilistic. Quantum mechanics appears probabilistic because it's an incomplete theory. Just as if you flip a coin in Newtonian mechanics, uh, it's a very complicated calculation, but it's 50% heads, 50% tails, because there's little fluctuations in how you flip it. But 
in full deterministic classical mechanics, if you can calculate the momentum you give it, all the air friction and everything, you can actually tell whether it's going to hand up heads or tails. Okay? So Einstein believed the full complete theory would enable you to take away this probabilistic nature. Bohr and Heisenberg said, nope, it's inherently probabilistic. All right. So um, now, Einstein believes in some objective reality independent of how you decide to measure it and says that, therefore, quantum mechanics is incomplete. And then he further postulates maybe these variables, like all the variables, the angular momentum, the air friction, everything else in the flip of the coin, maybe those variables are going to be hidden from physicists and maybe forever hidden. Maybe not. But we just happen not to know them now. So this is his so-called hidden variable conjecture. This is Einstein's hidden variable conjecture. <clears throat> so the trouble with this is, um, if these hidden variables were remain permanently hidden, then it looked like Einstein's conjecture is not falsifiable. He says, yeah, there's more information out there. We'll never see it. But there's more information out there that makes what our parent theory look probabilistic. Okay? Now, at that point, you might say, well, this is no longer physics. Because if you can't, if you postulate hidden variables that you can never see, then maybe you just, you know, that's a non false Bible theory, so it doesn't count. It's kind of like many infinite number of worlds cosmology, but they're never going to be in your light cone. Okay? Maybe that's not falsifiable either. And then something remarkable happened uh, in 1964. John Bell, actually a high energy th theorist, derived an inequality. And he said, you know, for two angles, you know, this way or that way in polarization, you can't tell the difference between hidden variable and quantum mechanics. But if you can choose three angles, it turns out you can tell the difference. And it's amazing. He just said, well, look, if you've got three angles, and then it's going to, you set your polarizer, let's say it's a linear polarizer, it would be this angle, this angle, that angle, and you're either going to get a photon transmitted through, or you're not. So it's a yes, no answer. And similarly over here. Well, you've got three angles, you've got two of these things, you've got eight possibilities. I can assign any random probability to those eight possibilities, and say, and any local hidden variable set theory says the state, the initial state, that shoots out the two electrons or the two photons could be in any of these possibilities. But it was determined here at the beginning and then before it's detected. And that's what you call a local hidden variable theory. He said any probability is allowed to assign. All they have to do is have they add up the probabilities to one. And, he, and Bell showed, and this is, there's only two more slides worth of algebra, showed, you know what? You can actually get a difference between any probability assumption of these eight states, which is a local hidden variable theory, you just don't know the probabilities, and quantum mechanics, which is an amazing thing. So for appropriate choice of angles, you can actually have um, a different prediction. So Bell writes this paper in 1964. Bohm envisions two electrons, positive and negative polarized. Then uh, John Clouser uh, with Shimoni and Oh, uh, John Clouser here? I don't know. Anyway, uh, besides, there's a, a formulation of this with photons. And at that time, this is about 19, late 1960s, middle to late 1960s, Clauser writes this paper. He was here at Berkeley. He was a, a postdoc of Charlie Towns. And, and he says, you know, I'd like to do this experiment. Charlie wants to do the experiment. And uh, somehow he gets Stuart to say, hey, this is, this is a neat experiment. So he's doing the experiment. I was a graduate student, as Gene said, beginning in 1970. I joined Gene's lab in the fall of 1971. And just in the second, then we eventually moved to the basement of Burge, and just down the room, a few doors down, was the Clauser-Friedman experiment. 
testing aquatic acts. It was, uh, we were trying to look for parity now conservation due to electroweak interactions. And so I have to confess, during that time, I had no idea how important this experiment was. That's, I had an inflated version of how important our experiment was, <laughs> but I had no idea how important Friedman Clauser's experiment was. And just so you know, this is John Clauser on the left, uh, and this is a picture of uh, the apparatus. It was, a, um, it was a tough way to do business. You'd have to excite a calcium atom to its excited state of uh, uh, total angular momentum equals zero. And then it would cascade down, uh, a branching ratio allowed to cascade down to emit a photon and another photon in very rapid succession. And so it went from total angular momentum equals zero to total angular momentum equals zero. And then you had this embodiment. The only trouble is, uh, it was a, in order to excite the atom, you either had a, needed a UV laser or a two photon laser or something like that, and they were using a UV lamp. And uh, it was a lousy branching ratio. And so uh, it was taking a lot of time to get statistics. Why was it so big? So this is the part, this calcium source. These long things had, uh, they needed very, very good polarizers. And then they decided, and they had you know, optics to catch as much of the solid angle as possible. But they didn't capture much of the many of the photons. But then, then they would say, OK, if I get a click here and I get a click here, that's in a small window of time. They must have come from a single decay of this calcium atom. And they slowly counted for months and months and months. Very reminiscent of all the experiments I did with Gene. We slowly counted for months and months and months. <laughs> and anyway, um, uh, the, the long chambers in here had parallel plates of glass. And if you go through lots of uh, reflections of parallel plate, one polarization you can transmit at Brewster angle with no loss, and the other has 15% loss. You add up a bunch of 15% losses, and it becomes a very efficient polarizer. It's a very clever apparatus. And, uh, and in 1972, they published their result. It's, um, uh, and it was about a 5.5 to 6 sigma result. It was a definitive result. And let me just show you. Um, that this line, they varied the angles of the polarizers. And uh, the solid line is the quantum mechanical prediction. And uh, that was the local hidden variable prediction. It was definitively not there. Now, um, sadly, I should say that um, uh, now Aspect came back with better apparatus. He used the laser, uh, got better data. He also allowed a first delay choice experiment, which said you emit the photon, and I will decide whether I'm going to look at this polarization or this polarization, uh, or this polarization or that polarization on the fly. And so he did that, because that was considered one of the, quote, loopholes. If you're a conspiracy person, you wouldn't say, well, that's all fine and good, but the original friedman clauser experiment didn't detect that many photons, and so they're missing a lot. And so even though that looks very compelling, if you're a conspiracy person, uh, sort of like you, know, you believe that uh, you make a loan to Slinger because we're, never mind. <laughs> uh, and there was nothing there. <laughs> and after a million pages of emails, there's no, still nothing there. But you still might think there may be something missing email. OK, so, so the first major, OK, this, 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 um, this, um, this, got, this work got the 2010 Wolf Prize. Uh, sadly, it did not go to Friedman and Clauser. It went to Clauser, Alan Aspe, who did a follow-up experiment with delay choice, and Anton Zeilinger, who did an improved experiment. But I would have to say, at least from my personal point of view, having taught this a bunch of times, uh, it was that first experiment that very first painful experiment, which was a really landmark experiment that said, oh my gosh, hit local hidden variables are wrong, and um, uh, quantum mechanics, unfortunately, is right. Um, uh, in fact, uh, that first experiment must have taken, I don't know, half a year of photon data. And uh, now you can get uh, 
30 sigma using nonlinear optics techniques in minutes. Um, but anyway, but that's okay. You, when you do experiments, the first time you do it is always the hardest. Uh, but then you get the answer the first time. The second person to discover equals mc squared doesn't matter as much. Uh, <clears throat> so, quantum mechanics remains counterintuitive. And the only thing it's got going for it's never been found to be incorrect. And so this reminds one of the story, uh, maybe apocryphal, but probably may be true, is that over Bohr's office, there hangs a horseshoe with its prongs up. And a uh, visitor says, surely you don't think this brings you good luck? To which Bohr says, oh, I don't believe in it. But I'm told it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> So quantum mechanics works even if you don't have an intuitive understanding of it. All right, now it's 35 minutes. I'm going to spend a few more minutes talking you through some pictures I got of Joyce, from Joyce Friedman. This is Stuart when he's a little kid. Um, <laughs> this, I love this picture because it really looks like that head doesn't belong to that body. <laughs> that was photoshopped on. But, but Joyce, is it real? <laughs> it's real, okay. This is Stuart, son, grandson. When he was doing this incredibly important experiment uh, in the basement of Burge, uh, working with Clauser, um, also had a, another life that I'm not sure Gene knew about. Um, first, Clauser was also a kind of a funny guy. He had a boat. But it wasn't a boat, it was a yacht, it was a sailing yacht. It was a wooden 50-foot sailing yacht that he had in the Berkeley Marina. How a postdoc could own a 50-foot <laughs> sailing yacht, we don't know. But it was wooden, which meant every weekend he had to work on the boat. It's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You're doing something and then by the time you're done with something else after about a year, year and a half, the, you have to just go back and do it again. And he actually got Stuart to help him fix his boat. The deal was, if Stuart would help him fix his boat, he would take Stuart out for rides. And since John Clauser actually raced a sailboat, he needed a crew, and he would get Stuart. Occasionally, he would get Mel Simmons, another graduate student, uh, in this group. Um, so he did that. He had a motorcycle. He and Mel Simmons, they were inseparable, uh, would take these dirt bikes and go up to Richmond in this motorcycle dirt path section and zoom around in motorcycles. Did you know that? I did. He did. <laughs> and then when I became a graduate student, I got a motorcycle instead of a car. And he was death, he, I remember you looking at me and he said, Steve, you just have to realize that anyone I know who's owned a motorcycle has been in a crash. <laughs> and so poor Gene was petrified that three graduate students had, would undo themselves in motorcycles. And indeed, they all, we all got into minor crashes of some kind. So Stuart would do motorcycle and dirt bike motorcycling. He would do gliding. He would do all this stuff. Uh, amazingly, while he was doing great physics. So um, and um, there he is uh, trying to uh, get a grandson <laughs> <laughs> excited in a motorcycle. Uh, uh, but. <clears throat> Now, he, he had a very philosophic view of life, uh, again, with a sense of humor. He would tell it honestly like it is, and he would get into these philosophical poses. And he famously had said, uh, life is a personnel problem. <laughs> and um, and uh, he did have sometimes some sharp elbows. And when I was... Um, director of Morris Berkeley Lab, uh, there was another great experiment that we were going to do in Dai Bay, and Stuart was not hitting off with the Chinese collaborator who was a Giorgio Grotta student, and this wasn't working. And so finally, I said, oh, I can't, I can't, we can't deal with this. Um, and Stuart would just, you know, okay, I'm going to do something else. Just went and did something else. Another great thing. And he moved constantly in this direction. Now, even though he had sharp elbows, the people I've talked with who might have clashed on more the organizational side, to one, they always said how brilliant he was as a physicist. 
And there was no doubt about that, and they loved working in him. And once you started talking about physics, it all melted away. And once you started writing papers with him, he was an exquisite writer and had incredibly high standards and would demand that the papers be absolutely clear. And again, many of his works reeked of that. Uh, this, again, it's from uh, his advisor. So we're with Joyce. Uh, I think they met in LA where they grew up and Stuart went to Berkeley as an undergraduate and Joyce was in LA, but Joyce joined him uh, uh, to go to graduate school here. Um, so many, many pictures of Stuart. We can post these all on the web if, if Joyce allows. Um, a little bit more about this group. So I joined uh, Gene's group in 1971. Stuart was there, Mel Simmons was there. Frank Kalpreis, another Gene Cummins student, a professor at Princeton, um, had left. Hyatt Gibbs, another you know, old distinguished physicist. Hyatt Gibbs, also a great physicist, had left and gone to Bell Labs. And, and Gene's older group, the one that did time reversal invariance, that was where Gene was looking and measuring nothing also for decades, right? In fact, you used to be so happy when we were doing parity non conservation because you used to say, at last, we're measuring something. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, and Stuart was doing this experiment, uh, measuring nothing, and Bill Simmons was doing another beta decay experiment. And uh, they put us all in this, Gene put us in, all three of us in a little a room for an office. And, um, um, you know, so we're, this is this family, you know, like Gene's the father and there are these kids and we're putting there. And what kids do to their siblings is the older siblings actually kind of want to make sure the younger sibling knows his boss. And Stuart really wanted to make sure <laughs> he knew I was a, kind of the senior graduate student. And, and we, I would put some stuff on the desk, but I'm kind of disorganized. And so my papers would kind of slide over, and there's this mutual desk. And Stuart got so irritated that he finally said, Chu, you're encroaching on my territory. So he took a piece of black tape and laid it in the middle of the desk. <laughs> I said, don't go over that. And he took some black tape on the floor and said, don't go over here either. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, uh, uh, that was what life was like. Uh, then Stuart left to go to Princeton, followed by Stanford and then Argonne. Uh, Mel left to work on energy. Um, and, but it was an amazing group. And then I was the first of the next generation now, Lee Sherper was also Gene's student who did great stuff in energy, but Gene wasn't really paying attention. To, he was co-signing mostly, it was fair to say, for his thesis in, in astronomy. Um, but Darren was the first of this new group, uh, followed by, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember in rank order, uh, Phil Buxbaum, and no, Ralph Conti uh, was in year after me, then Phil, then Larry Hunter, then Percy Strell, uh, uh, it's remarkable, if you look at Gene students, how many of them turn out to be so amazing. Most of us spent at least some time measuring nothing. Uh, doing, for example, me doing precision measurements, trying to look for the first decimal point of a breakdown of something and not finding anything that the standard theory fit. Uh, and it continues. Stewart's 17 kV uh, experiment, he couldn't find 17 kV. The remarkable thing about it was uh, very clearly, definitively, couldn't find 17 kV, but fast forward many years, and now using microwave background radiation, we know that some of the masses is less than about a third of an eV. So we have all these wonderful things going on at Berkeley. So this is not only really a testament to Stewart, and his memory, but if you look back at all the things that were happening in Berkeley, starting with the microwave background discovery of Arnold Penzias, but Smoot's Nobel Prize, the stuff uh, the, of measuring the anisotropy uh, with Paul Richards and his crew and all the others following around. And then that turned into a precision measurement in the last couple of years where it gets you this fantastic limit. Um, I want to end by just 
saying how fabulous a physicist Stuart was. He, when you got to know him, he was truly funny <laughs> in this very sardonic way. Uh, uh, as you heard in the introduction, uh, the world was a better place for Stuart. The world of physics was a better place for Stuart. He was very, very honest. Uh, uh, but despite all of that, he, he actually was also a very decent, warm human being. Uh, despite sometimes he would just tell you, you know, you don't understand this. <laughs> and then he would proceed to explain it with blinding clarity, right? He was a really a brilliant in that way. And that's why he probably wrote so well. But uh, so for those of us who got to know him, I think people like Bob Kahn and others uh, who got to really know him uh, uh, can remember him very fondly. But um, again, I'm very pleased to have uh, started this and sorry about my inability to uh, show you the pictures embedded in the PowerPoint, but that's okay. Um, uh, it's it's uh, part of life. But anyway, thank you.